now we will actually press ahead and we have mentioned that we have covered AI and the risks that AI poses. We also dwelt on the issues which have to be addressed by engineers and healthcare workers. However, we have not covered ethical problems and they will be occurring everywhere in automotive, in healthcare and everywhere. What do you think, Mark? We've already spoken about that. Indeed, this is a different dimension that we as technicians or scientists, of course, we may not take it uh, seriously enough in the first wave because technology is ahead for us of that. But this is a necessary dimension, human dimension, ethical dimension in use of AI in everyday life. When a scanner scans uh, a road or the environment, it may scan also other things besides just the road and its environment. And therefore, we should always keep in mind that those who collect uh, data gets approach to data and they should have uh, at least a clearly defined ethical code. This is a chapter to be discussed for sure. I welcome by that our next speaker who will I hope beautifully describe the topic. David Cherney is here, designated as a philosopher, ideal profession for our subject. Can we hear each other? Yes, I can hear you very well, which is perfect. So, could you make us acquainted with how ethics can play a role in our contemporary world? Thank you for the world. Word. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes, which means that I cannot go deeper into problems. Let me speak on a general level. In my presentation today, I will think over some uh, uh, problems of uh, general character, of AI, super intelligence, uh, whether there is an existential risk it will be just a short part of my presentation. After that, I will pass to an effort to state and show as well that uh, AI is not the problem of its own itself, but it's rather use of AI, the, which may be an issue and our approach to it. And then we will try to define fields where ethical problems are topical. And again, we will try to prove that it's not the, the problem of toxicity of AI itself, but it's the problem of uh, the things that people sometimes use approaches that go beyond ethics. So this is the general framework, framework of my presentation. And as I promised, I will start with what's being discussed very much uh, recently, whether AI may be a threat. By the way, let me say that all pictures were generated by AI in my presentation, which is another proof that AI may be a perfect tool that helps us in many aspects. However, oftentimes, and it's due to the fact that the topic is very attractive, um, it's a bus uh, topic, uh, journalists uh, are sometimes attracted to state that it is a threat that can extinguish us. In our Western civilization, approach to technologies has been predetermined by our concepts of uh, AI in sci-fi literature. There are many studies that show that. And that's it's interesting that in our Western so society, AI is rather pessimistic in its different forms, robots and other types. AI is rather a line uh, entity that is far away from human and uh, ultimately may threaten or even endanger humanity and may even exterminate it. 
If you look at Japan, for instance, uh, perception of technologies is very different. They do not perceive AI as a threat, rather as an intermediary helping people to mature and to maintain a good and a healthy lifestyle. So this is given by religious and cultural uh, environment in Japan. In our country and countries, it's usually divided. There is human on one hand, and there is technique and technology on the other hand. And we do not realize that technology may be perceived as a very radical cognitive extension of us, humans. It, enable us, it enables us to process better information, to get a better understanding of the world, to overcome different physical obstacles and limits. So we may perceive it as something natural. Based on our knowledge, it can be definitely an extension of our skills that we gain during our evolution and that are very limited. So this very idea that AI may be the very last human invention in the sense that when it reaches a certain level it will take over the reign of the world and will not have the need to leave uh, humans living here. Uh, it may be overcome. Until recently AI was uh, framed as this. Now uh, there are new frameworks uh, containing also different uh, threats. So we may divide them into three different criteria uh, fields, uh, the extent that is rather minimum, the extent that is more serious, or uh, the risk that is really uh, global may cover a transgenerational uh, transfer, which means that there will be no further generations or their life will be so low quality, so deteriorated that we will not consider it anymore as human lifestyle. These may be horrifying threats, those global and transgenerational ones. And uh, those global and or transgenerational risks, they should lead to extermination of uh, humans uh, to survival in only something as biological form with no respect to human rights, with no respect to our diversity and so on and so forth. In this uh, context, the uh, AI is very perceived as uh, a transgenerational existential risk higher than uh, climate the change or any other risk. How should we cope with it? Scenarios existing, ex scenarios are very hypothetical. Very often they are based on sci-fi, but the core is very simple. There is a, a general artificial uh, intelligence that will very, be very soon uh, super intelligence and if this super intelligence is created uh, there will be also OUI there will be explosion of more and more uh, intelligent AIs another importance of singularity is that we will lose insight into a complexity of new devices and machines we will stop being able to understand their functioning and therefore this singularity uh, represents a moment we will lose all control over our life and the planet. Why should AI exterminate human uh, humankind? Uh, one of the explanations is it will not like us, it will take us as a certain risk and therefore it will exterminate us, but it doesn't need to happen. It will be far enough if AI solves tasks uh, in which uh, humans will be an obstacle to reaching the solution. David Russell said, uh, we humans look at people with a lower intelligence uh, with uh, uh, despise. And if there are ants and we build a dam, we will just uh, condemn, uh, we will just sacrifice ants. And uh, something similar may happen with uh, two humans in the 
future that the AI will not take care of humans if they are in the way of solving some, uh, uh, some task. But AI should develop further tasks, and among them, there should be protection of one's own existence, not for self-preserving instinct. Uh, we humans, we have, AI does not have, but in order to be able to fulfill the final goal, which is uh, to uh, act in such a way that humans cannot switch me off. There may be different uh, defaulted uh, uh, reaching the goals so that AI arrange for human beings uh, being happy through some specific vaccination. This is not exactly what people had on mind. Or if we charge AI to make uh, clips for paper and it will produce clips for paper for such a long time that it will destroy all reserves of uh, paper and wood for humanity, and then it will go further for ha having material for these paper clips. So it will not uh, act in such a destructive way that because it would like to do so, but uh, it will w continue this way because it will be programmed this way. So how much real is it? I don't think it's very realistic because we do not get to this level of AI. The systems we use already, the systems that exist today, such as large language models, are extraordinary, admirable. They may uh, do a lot of things, but they are limited at the same time, and they are not able to overcome their limits, limits done by their architects, by algorithms. And even if we create many systems uh, uh, that will uh, control cars that will make diagnostics and so on and so forth, still these systems will be impacted or uh, linked to given parameters uh, given by uh, humans, and it's difficult to imagine that uh, they would be able of such things as to prevent people to switch them off. So uh, there is a certain hypothesis that uh, AI could get the anthropomorph. There could be anthropomorphization of AI in the way that AI sh could start behaving as uh, people wrongly or uh, correctly, but it doesn't need to happen. And one more example I have: these language models. Uh, they are very much written about now, and they are really fascinating. However, they lack all important things we connect with human intelligence. They do not understand the sentences. They do not know what they do. They created that perfect statistical analysis between words, context, sentences, and based on that, they can give you solutions or answers. And it resembles very much to John Searle's experiment, a Chinese room. Several argumented against possibilities of strong AI so, uh, that would have a conscious understanding of uh, semantics, and he proclaimed that uh, it has only synthetics, not semantics. Uh, common AI does not need to be super intelligence. And his <coughs> experiment, mental experiment, was that we have a room with a person that doesn't speak Chinese but has a perfect manual. And if you give him a sign in English, he's able to connect the sign in English to a sign in Chinese. And it looks as if the room understands Chinese, but there's no comprehension of uh, the symbols. These language models are very much like that, uh, with the difference that we haven't, we have given them certain rules no, sorry, we haven't given them a certain rules. It's the AI that created the rules itself based on algorithms. But uh, uh, in parallel with this Chinese room, there is no understanding, there is no motivation, there are no intentions. Let's continue. What I am much more intrigued uh, by 
And what I like much more in discussion about the intelligence and superintelligence is that it takes us away from real problems that are current problems needing our solution. We are surrounded by many systems of AI that have a basic impact on our way and living, uh, living standard, and therefore they decide about how we will further develop, and we are not able to keep pace with them. Well, the real issue, as I see it, is our passivity. That means we are not flexible enough in responding to the risks when uh, we have uh, more AI systems, including the uh, shortage of AI knowledge in schools. We have fail to adapt uh, the curricula so people don't know about the limits of these technologies they don't know how to use them correctly and that can influence negatively our thinking another trend which is not a very positive one is that we speak about liability or responsibility of ai as if there were any I would say humanity is supposed to be responsible or liable for things that happen and that's why we as a society should create a responsibility culture in which such systems will be developed and devised, designed as uh, good um, and actually nurturing for the humanity. Well, ethics in AI. There are variant documents. This is actually a document from a group of scientists uh, where, and it says that uh, AI should actually uh, abide by laws, should be ethical and reliable. And we speak about autonomy, about fairness, about um, actually clarity, about harm. Well, of course, these uh, principles have got their limits because, of course, they came from various uh, uh, experts who have got various um, actually opinions. But there are various systems of some intelligence degrees but each every system has got actually different tasks so a better approach would be to consider a specific system uh, let's say autonomous driving or telemedicine or military robots and uh, address the issues in those specific areas and let me pinpoint some issues uh, which we uh, battle nowadays and show you how we actually get involved by uh, AI well we have been speaking about the so-called pandemic of bad thinking um, people are actually not able to think critically anymore, to categorize uh, knowledge or information, to verify, validate it. That means this system of critical thinking has been actually uh, somehow damaged uh, and people actually uh, believe disinformation, false information. And AI plays a role here, but there are mechanisms uh, that actually strengthen this uh, trend, and these are those bubbles, uh, as you see on the slide. There are algorithms which actually spew those bubbles, information bubbles, and they actually distribute information in those bubbles, and people are exposed to um, those uh, individual opinions, and people then believe it. Uh, very similarly, there is another image uh, 
showing that algorithms actually connect us with people who have uh, very similar opinions and they might be actually false. And artificial intelligence actually uh, uh, boosts these trends, but it, it is not the main culprit, it's the uh, human being who should uh, use critical thinking. Another issue is uh, that uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence is going to um, take all work uh, and will replace us at uh, work. Um, it might be true, but only partially. It depends on uh, the job we have. Uh, for many of us, we go to work because we need money uh, to um, be able to cover our needs and for many people who see it this way it might not be a tragedy if they uh, actually are replaced by AI and uh, that does not mean that they will stop working uh, it, that means that they will actually change jobs they might actually um, lead some extracurricular activities or some clubs, they might actually uh, do their hobbies and do something that they like. If we um, find out how to feed them, it could be a nice reality. So you see this picture here on the slide, if the robots do our work and we know uh, what to do during that time, then it is fine. It will depend on our society whether the problems related to uh, actually uh, the shortage of work is not contributing to the uh, gap between the rich and poor. Another issue I would like to speak about um, is democracy. We have got empirical studies showing that democracy is not working as it should. It doesn't mean that uh, you go and uh, vote. We This is a formal element, but of course there is um, there is more to it. That means that people should participate in government, in public administration, and people uh, need to be active. And those empirical studies or research show that um, people don't read uh, the uh, agendas of political parties, the manifestos, they are not interested in it. It's more emotional, the relationship. And of course, uh, once uh, there are global challenges uh, occurring, we need more knowledge. And AI is used and can actually prepare uh, populist uh, speeches and the speeches will be perfect and reach out to uh, the audience. What I found out that Barack Obama used that. I was actually surprised that they actually prepared uh, the, uh, the speeches for him so that he is liked by his audience. So that could be also uh, an issue. Another risk post is as follows. AI might, of course, identify threats, but at the same time, we are being watched. We actually are present in social networks. Once we buy something, we buy some robotic tool, then the data is gathered. Uh, this 
doesn't need to be a problem but what if governments uh, use it en masse um, in China that is uh, actually happening nowadays and that means that we are a private entity and we want to actually speak about private thinking also and such systems uh, watching us could actually endanger uh, our freedom and now i'm not speaking about direct threat by ai i'm speaking about misuse of it uh, military robots this is technology that is uh, not spoken about so often and this is a something that is developed all the time and there are so many ethical problems so we shouldn't forget about it another example would be this system compass which can predict the probability of somebody relapsing if a criminal actually repeats his crimes and of course it can work uh, statistically but not individually and that is why we should never use AI for this area for this issue we know technology works but we know that technology um, is not aligned with our values, the values of our society, so we should not use it in this area. Well, in conclusion, I'd like to say that future is in our hands and the relationship between a person and technology has been perceived antagonistically, but we should speak about co-evolution. That means AI will be evolving next to us, next to humanity, and of course we will see kyborgs developing to some degree. And this evolution might be exciting and might be actually mutually beneficial, but if it backfires, then uh, it will harm humanity. And my last slide is here. What I've read is that GPT 3.5 wrote that people are afraid that AI will is, uh, exterminate us. And he was encouraged um, to write some positive message. And this is the message. Of course, I would like to uh, pacify people who are afraid of AI, but you have to see that AI is a tool which can be used for good and bad purposes. And how AI is develops in the future will uh, depend on people and their values. And that's why don't lose hope and be active when developing the future with AI. We have the opportunity to use AI for addressing climatic change, healthcare, or new industrial um, areas. And that's why we should try to create relationship between people and AI. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring, this presentation. And now I want to mention some comments online saying that AI wants to make us happier and that's why they actually uh, contribute to uh, us being more stupid, uh, less educated. But I would also like to ask about challenges. So what challenges do you see in education? as a system. We apologize for technical issues. We somehow cannot control, but uh, you can raise your questions also subsequently 
As far as I look at the questions, many of them went into very depth of the subject, so you can contact the speaker. And at this moment, I would like to thank all our morning block speakers. We will continue after our break.